Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Ja, yeah. good evening everybody. Um, warm welcome, welcome in the Bali. On this um, special occasion with Ben Judah, uh, who just uh, today took the train from London to Amsterdam. And four or five hours is it, I guess? Yeah, so he just arrived, just had dinner, just relaxed a little bit. And, um, and we're very happy he's here, Ben Judah, to talk about, well, I think there's plenty to talk about if we talk about England, if we talk about Brexit, if we talk about London and developments there. Um, my name is Tim Wagemakers, I'm program editor, and tonight I'll be your host. Um, and as I said, I'm very happy that Ben is here because there's plenty to talk about, but also because his work provides, I think, a great entrance to talk about underlying issues that are currently happening in England, but also in Europe and also in Amsterdam maybe, because if we talk about how migration is changing cities, um, that's not only happening in London, that's happening uh, in entire Europe. And we can talk about that. Um, he is, as you are probably well aware, the author of uh, two well-received well books. First one, Fragile Empire about Russia. Second one, a bit more relevant maybe for tonight, but we'll see, maybe Fragile Empire comes into uh, uh, comes into the talk was uh, This is London, um, which is an account of the city's variety and its divisions. And uh, um, Ben Judah shows us, um, well, the capital of the UK through the eyes of the beggars, the bankers, the coppers, um, the gangsters, the sex workers, the witch doctors even. And, and his account of contemporary London is uh, showing the city in all its colors, something that caused quite a stir because some people found out that they didn't know their city as well as they thought they knew it, something Ben Judah, I think, uh, showed in a very blunt but important manner. Um, during this program, Ben Judah will reflect on his work, will tell us a little bit more about current developments, uh, maybe also a bit about Brexit and what Europe should learn from uh, London and how migration changes European cities. Um, after his talk, I will engage with him in conversation. Then Cody Holstenbach will join us. He is a postdoctoral researcher uh, in urban geography at the University of Amsterdam. And he can tell us something about, well, the similarities one might see in other European cities uh, and the underlying processes that are taking place of migration and gentrification also. Um, and of course, at the end of the night, there will be a lot of room for questions from you. So if you listen to what's being said, please think about your question already. Um, 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 there are no stupid questions, only questions that are not asked. That's, I think, the, the cliche you, you should say at this moment, but it's really true. So please think about it, and there will be really plenty of time. Um, and we will end this night at around 9.30, 9.45. Um, but yeah, for now, let's just start. And I'd like to give the floor to our main guest of tonight. Uh, he will speak about This is London. Give him a warm welcome, Ben Judah. I will, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here at this wonderful uh, venue uh, this evening. As I was on the Eurostar gliding through the French uh, countryside to, to meet you this evening, I, started, I was thinking about what I was going to say, and the main thought that came into my head is that when you go on book tour, you feel like an employee of your former self and that I felt incredibly distant from the person who wrote this book uh, several years ago. But I feel like very much I'm working for him and have to represent him this evening, even though I'm not entirely sure 
I'm not, not entirely sure who he was anymore, or even if I agree with him. And in some ways, I'm a little bit disturbed by him, looking back at uh, what he was uh, up to a few, uh, a few years ago. I wrote this book without realising it in the, in the shadow of Brexit. I had worked as a journalist covering Russia and Eastern Europe, Russia and Eastern Europe. And as I was out in Russia, shuttling across uh, that continent nation's vast expanses, meeting corrupt officials, um, dissidents, and the occasional saintly figure, I was working in a particular literary style, which is the literary style of the foreign correspondent, where instead of only giving the microphone to the intellectuals arguing in Moscow, you give the microphone to the poor, to the people. You try and tell the story of a country through voices far from the capital city and far from its ruling class. And you do as much as you can to try and get out from beyond the confines of that establishment. When I came back to be in London full time, I had been so used to writing in this style. I found British newspapers kind of very hard to understand with their, prolif with their insistence on approaching the main topics of the day, either through columnists or through statistics. I found that there was very little reporting, you know, doing like a foreign correspondent, giving the microphone to people to let them freely express themselves and to give time to understand them, like, like foreign correspondents have been trying to do in Russia or elsewhere around the world. And as I was thinking this, I sort of tried to sort of re-engage with the city where, where I was born, and I realized I didn't recognize it. I didn't understand it anymore. It was being so transformed by massive immigration and also by a massive influx, not just of people, but of money and of capital, by transformation of areas through the pressures of gentrification or the pressures of um, intense flush of capital through uh, property, that I, I didn't recognize it from the city that I grew up in, not really that long ago either. So I began thinking, how can I how can, I write, how can I write about this? How can I write, how can I write about all of these, these two pressures on Western society and on British society, which seem to meet in London? The story of immigration and the story of, story of capital and housing. So I thought both of those topics are incredibly ideological and almost impossible to talk about. And that there are a large amount of books written on immigration, or a large amount of polemicists on immigration, and of, on the issues of capital and property as well. So I decided that I would write a book without any opinion in it. I would write a book purely composed of the views of the people that I met uh, along my way, and that I would let give the microphone about London to everybody but me, to everybody but the people that we were used to hearing, to give it to everybody but the MPs, but the the sort of the, the, the sort of professional columnists and uh, the amateur columnists like myself. And that was how the, the genesis of this book, uh, this, the genesis of this book uh, began. As I began, as I began uh, working, as I began working on it, and sort of profiling one by one by one people from very very different walks of life, each of them from an immigrant uh, background, all of them new to London, all of them that had arrived to London at some point in their lives, or maybe not so new, some of them who'd spent most of their lives in uh, in London, a couple of themes started to come out of the journey, which felt very different from the London that I had been thinking about and reading about. The first trend that struck me was that the story that I had got through the statistics, the story that I got through the research, didn't appear to match up with how I saw work happening in London. And that the research that I was sort of getting from think tanks or getting from 
uh, government employees or experts assumed that the data was the whole story. But actually, there was a vast chunk of the London labor force that was working cash in hand only, that was not covered by labor regulations, that was not being covered by minimum wage. And in order to explore this more, I tried to use some immersive techniques. I tried to get at it from various points of, various points of view, sort of uh, copying or mimicking, I guess, these sort of infamous Orwellian techniques to go into this situation. And I was really struck by what I saw, which not being picked up by the data, you had this large immigrant labor force, mostly from Eastern Europe, which was not existing in a minimum wage economy, which was being paid what it could bargain for, which was being paid at times a chicken and chips or whatever it took to, to work for the day, that was, not, that was not being picked up by the statistics. As I followed this, as I immersed this with this, this sort of stream of the labor market, I tried to live in a manner as similar as, as possible to them. And I found, again, there was a story that wasn't being picked up by the statistics, which was this trend of massive overcrowding that you had across London, you have the proliferation of DOS houses, where instead of there being, by the regulations, three people maximum or four people maximum to a two-person flat, you had maybe eight, 10, 12, 20 crammed in all so all could be identified parallel through the internet where people were advertising where to live. And that there was this parallel, vastly overcrowded London that was uh, behind, the scene, behind the scenes and not being picked up again by the statistics. And the third trend that I saw was that these two aspects, overcrowding and a labor force not being covered by regulation was interacting on the edges of London with a white working class population that was becoming extremely agitated by this and claiming that their experiences were being denied by politicians or were not being picked up or answered by politicians in what I didn't know at the time but was the run up to run up to Bre the run up to Brexit. So as I once I finished the the book. I remember at the time knowing that there was a European referendum being planned. But I didn't sort of think it was particularly important, and I wasn't particularly in, I wasn't particularly interested in it. But having been sort of freed from the the book, I found myself working as a you know as a sort of jobbing journalist uh, again. And then I departed on this journey through the UK, writing for various publications, including Politico and uh, writing uh, columns here and there, including for the New York Times. And this theme of immigration was incredibly strong as I traveled through the uh, Europe, through the EU uh, referendum, through the EU referendum, trying to work out why so many chunks of the British Middle England, as it's called, Middle England, or chunks of the British lower middle class and middle class were so enthusiastic about this, uh, about this idea. So I kept on hearing through the course of these trips something that was not quite being reflected with the discussion that was going on on television, or the discussion that was going on in the newspaper, or the discussion that was even being mediated through polls, which was this constant refrain that England's not England anymore. That England had been transformed by immigration, it was becoming an unrecognizable place, and that the mantra of take back control uh, from Brexit, the people who were saying that were primarily thinking about immigration, primarily thinking about immigration. The key swing voters were primarily thinking about that. After the result, I decided to look at this question from another angle, which was to try and look at it historically. And something that really came out of the research when you try and work out you know, what has happened to Britain in recent history is that despite this 
narrative of solidity, keep calm and carry on, sort of an unbroken chain going back to the past. What comes out of the research is that England has been incredibly transformed, and Britain too, as a result, simply in the one reign of Elizabeth II. So that if you go back to when Elizabeth II was crowned in 1953, crowned as the queen not only of of, Brita, of uh, Great Britain, but Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Pakistan, Ceylon, and these territories beyond the sea, it was a different country demographically. And that estimates vary. The non-white population of, the, of Britain at the time was between 20,000 and half a million people. And this is a society where 70% of the population were manual workers. If we fast forward to uh, if we fast forward to today, we see a population which is 12% non-white and 20% of the population of England and Wales are either immigrants or their children. So there's been a complete demographic transformation in this uh, in this sort of period. And if you look at London, the London that I was writing, I have been writing about in this book, a population where you have around 40% of the population who are foreign born. If you go back to the Queen's childhood in the 1930s, you have, uh, shockingly, less than 3% of the population of London that was foreign born. So I think that it's important in this discussion about what's happened to Britain and what's happened, what, what are these forces that have led to Brexit and have led to this situation to, to recognise that the country has gone through a historical transformation, uh, has gone through a historical transformation and the country is very much evolving into a new uh, country and to try as a journalist or as a reporter not to be not to be ideological or not to be dogmatic in the way that you go about reporting that. And instead of trying to present, try and report on immigration as a morality play or try and report on it as a question of national identity or political identity, to try and do as much as possible to report it through the points of view of the immigrants uh, themselves, the people living that experience or the people whose lives are being transformed by immigration, which is what I tried to do in, uh, what I tried to do in this is, uh, what I tried to do in this is London. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Yeah. You can sit down. You can talk again, Mike. Okay, sure. There's water there if you, if you want to sit. Um, Maybe first of all, is this one on yet? Yeah. Maybe first of all, you started your small talk by saying, um, I'm not sure if I agree with him when you talk to the one you are employed to now, the writer who wrote This Is London. Uh, well, yes. No, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not really, well, I guess, you know, I'm, 30, I'm 31 now. When I started writing that book, how old was I? It was like 20... Three. That was like 2014. You know, Five so, years ago. So I was 26. You know, I do very much feel like another person. You know, I'm not really sure who he was or why why he was doing that. You know, sort of like, you know, what yeah. what was the what was the obsession? Yeah, yeah. But in the meanwhile, several things happened. You already alluded a little bit to uh, Brexit, which is underway or not underway, and things are happening, uh, so to say. What does this book say to you right now? in 2019? I mean, it's distant, but at the same time... The book's not distant. The person who wrote yeah, it is yeah, distant. Yeah. You know, I think the book is... You know, I think it's... You know, because, like, we are in a period of historical transformation of our societies, because we are in a period where... Because we are in a period where these questions of national identity and political identity are so wrapped up in immigration, it becomes very, very easy to write about it in a completely abstract way. And I think the book 
just doesn't engage with that. Yeah. And the yeah. book, you know, gives the microphone to all of these people from all of these different backgrounds to tell their own story and representing it in that way, I think it actually is quite radical, just to yeah. let people say what's on their minds, talk about their own lives, to talk about their own experiences of work. So that was, you know, I, I'm, quite, I'm still very proud of that. Yeah. And I think that it still remains quite, you know, it's not, mm. you know, relatively, you know, relatively unique yeah. in but that approach. But the one thing that happens to a country when there's a big wake-up call, for example, the Brexit yeah. referendum, is that they start soul-searching. Like, what did we miss? And, and you show that in your book, I think, what was being missed, what was not being seen. Did you see a change in the, in the past three years? Are, are, are people, or the elite, whatever, however you might call them, or the p politicians, are they better in touch with what's going on? I think that... In the run-up to Brexit, you could see a lot of trends in the UK developing. One was that these pillars of Britishness were crumbling. The idea that the country was a Protestant country, that belonged to a particular sect, had been crumbling for a generation. The idea that the most important identity was being British, it wasn't being English, Welsh, Scottish, that was crumbling. The idea that the country was ordered in a certain set of classes and that there was an order in them of who mm. should have the right to speak first, that was crumbling. Popular attitudes to the monarchy, these old institutions, these political parties, and they were crumbling as well. And you could, there were intellectuals who saw that. Since the Brexit uh, referendum, I think that that has gone from a conversation on the margins to very much a dominant one. And I think the self-perception of the country has you know, managed to focus on you know, what it's closer to what the reality is, which yeah. is a, a, you know, what has a country which is really extremely different from that of when the Queen was, uh, yeah. was crowned. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, quite a fragile, multi-ethnic construct you know, with overlapping jurisdictions that don't always sort of cooperate. Yeah, so it's multi-ethnic, but at the same time, if you read your book, well, you must come to the conclusion that while it's maybe super diverse, it's also segregated. It, it, it might not be this is London, but these are Londons. These yeah. are different boroughs, different districts, not talking to each other. I think there was like a moment in London that went that you know, began with Tony Blair and which ended you know, really after the, the sort of London uh, Olympics where the city was held up as this image of successful multicultural capitalism. Yeah, yeah. That London was, I'm sorry? No, I was, I was just, oh. there's actually one quote I think yeah, sure, sure. from your book which for me was really, which struck and I think follows your Tony Blair anecdote and it, and it says it's in Peckham <laughs> and, th and then you write, this is the front line of New London. The estate rises up six stories, ugly like a decked paper tray. Elephant and Castle is where Tony Blair came in 1997 to give his first speech as prime minister. People cheered. He called them the people forgotten by government. Now, one by one, their homes are being knocked down. So yeah. the question then is, how did we get from there to here? Um, I think that... You know, I think that there was these trends that were happening below the surface in, uh, in London of the other side of gentrification, of the overcrowding that was developing, of the parallel labour market that were developing. I think that they were just very, they were not, they were not grasped as being important by the Blair government when there was a lot of public funding going into local government and when the austerity measures were implemented by the Cameron government as part of a very ideological attempt to shrink the state that went far and beyond what uh, was what made sense in terms of economic theory or practice, there was no willingness to do that. So if we take one example of an issue that wasn't quite understood is if you look at how the British government anticipated the, the joining of the EU of Eastern European member states, they looked at the 
GDP figures of these countries and assumed that they were close enough to the UK, France, and Germany that there wouldn't be a large mass migration of people coming uh, west. However, those GDP figures of those countries were misleading because they were aggregate figures of cities with wildly inflated property values and stock bubbles and booms and life in the countryside where you had extremely high levels of unemployment and you know, continued decay following the fall of the communist socialist sort of uh, system. And it was not understood that uh, it was it, they, it was not understood that there was a huge emigration potential from those areas. So whereas other countries chose to put interim labour checks in place, the UK the UK didn't. So that made it a primary destination mm. in those first few years of migrants from particularly from Poland. So that's an example of them not quite not quite getting it in terms of these two other trends of minimum wage, people not being paid minimum wage, and of overcrowding. So it's, we can get a bit, we can talk in quite a broad brush way. We can say, you know, oh, this is a crisis of the welfare state. But I think we should be a little bit more precise here, which is those are a crisis of the regulatory state. And labor markets in Europe can really be quite different. And you have a situation in Britain and France, for example, is very, very different. Britain has very low unemployment, large amount of in-work poverty. France, the other way around, France has very high unemployment, less in-work poverty. And a decision was made in the UK not to aggressively police minimum wage yeah. and not to aggressively police housing uh, overcrowding. And those decisions were made as the result of cuts yeah. put in place by the Conservative And that's why government. you lose people. You don't see them anymore. And that's why they don't crop up in the statistics. Yeah. That's, yeah. Why they don't crop in the, that's why they don't crop up in the statistics. In different European countries, it can be very different. Yeah. Like in Scandinavia, you can have a more, you have a stronger regulatory state. And in Germany as well, to a certain extent, in Southern Europe, Yeah. Uh, a, a much weaker regulatory state, and a state that's not quite captured by the statistics. Yeah. In another way, I think that what this book is like revolting against is there's a certain like illusion or megalomania or that comes simply, I think, from the internet. That the idea, because I can find out so quickly what percentage of the H the Egyptian population spoke was. Uh, you know, was a Christian in 1250, oh, done it, like 0.2 seconds on Google, it gives us the illusion that actually all information is online and it takes us away from yeah. actual research on the ground. We actually go from necessary. the statistic to the analysis. Exactly, and there's, yeah. not, there's not enough questioning of those statistics in no. general conversation and there's not enough... There's, yeah. there's not enough, like, sort of uh, shoe lever, as yeah. we would call it. Well, so. I think that's maybe another fallacy you're going to point me on, I think, because if I dive into a statistic, I would say you argue that migration was one of the forces behind Brexit. Still, people say, well, in London, they voted for Remain, another statistic. Yeah. Well, again, it's like, it's, like, it's an interesting question. It's like, what is London? Or what is Amsterdam as a you know, a, as a space. Like, is London the sort of eight million people who live in that space? Is London, what about the four million people that commute every day and work, spend their working day in London and leave in the evening? So, so what is London? Who is, who is London? Who is New York? Who is, you know, who is Paris? And that's a quite an interesting, that's quite an interesting question. And then if you look across the UK, it's, There's been, again, I think this is a problem that comes from infographics and like so much of our, it comes, so much of our approach to things comes from dividing the UK up into yellow areas for Remain and blue areas for, uh, for Leave. And this is, this is this sort of trend that the New York Times pioneered with red states and blue states in the, in the weekend supplements in the 90s. Uh, but even in London, yes, it voted by a majority For Remain, but 30% of people who live in London still voted to leave. And if you're going to include the people who work in London every day, oh, suddenly we're getting closer to 50-50. So yeah. I think that that's, 
dangerous to, to I just deduct think it's it just mis- to it just the, misses yeah. it. It's just yeah. it's just simplistic and you're actually you know, what you don't want to do as a journalist or as an analyst, or just as a citizen, you don't want to buy into these political narratives. You know, and there are people who are trying to sell you the idea that there is Brexit Britain and Remain Britain and this is Remain Town and I'm a Remain you know, you just like no. Things are splintered, yeah. complicated, confusing, and yeah. it's your job, you know, not yeah. But, yeah. but what strikes me then as a journalist is that in, in your in your in your short talk you just gave. Sure. You say that you actually need the foreign correspondent style. You yes, needed that I, style I do, yeah. to get to know your own country. Um, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yes, actually, because I think that you know this. Um, I think it's changed since the referendum, but the, and it's the cha- attitude of the journalists. Yeah, it's changed. It's gone, maybe in some ways gone in the opposite direction. But like prior to 2016 and the, the events mm. in the Anglo-Saxon world that happened in this, tra- tra- this uh, key year, there, there, was, there had not been for really quite a long time a culture of doing these portraits of different towns and neighbourhoods and areas to see what people, people were, were, thinking, were thinking there. That had really been sort of left out since Brexit and Trump. There have been these trends, which I'm sure you've noticed, of mm. you know, writing about what people think in small towns by the sea in the north of England, or writing about people in Trump country or wherever that yeah. is. Let's and go on safari in Trump that, country. I, I don't think it's a safari. Actually. I do mm. think it's actually it can be done badly. Yeah, done badly, it'll be shit like anything. But I do <laughs> think that there's been a there's been a necessary correction. There's to be a necessary correction there. The trouble with the way that those narratives are put forward is that safari issue, is that there's a tendency for you know, upper, upper middle class editors and journalists to think that, you know, to, to, to abstract segments of the population, exoticize them and do these sort of foreign correspondent on the white working class, which I think is, uh, leads them to miss the fact, which I hopefully didn't in, in, in my reporting, which that, you know, so many of the key areas are, uh, that, that voted for Brexit, actually these actually quite well to do yeah. middle class, you know, middle class, upper middle class areas in the south of England. And a trend that I think I'm really actually quite shocked by is that the most, one of the most interesting and unexpected political trends happening right now in the UK, in some ways, some of the most bizarre, are Remainers. And this large mobilisation of Remainers. And I think this is happening so close to the editorial Mm -hmm. class that you're not getting enough sort of... There's not enough abstraction or distance or reporting uh, on it. But I mean, the holy grail in the the whole situation, even with people who are now saying maybe we should have another referendum again, is to to answer that question, what does the country want? Well... I mean, I'm, that's what everyone's. I'm like very. Uh, I this. You know, we're talking about two things. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the, the book, and then, yeah, and we're talking about my my sort of pundit views. Like, I, like, I don't think. You know, I'm really, really suspicious of these, these cat of these big these big categories. Yeah, and I think that you know they're useful and we have to use them. I don't think they reflect what societies are actually like. And what I tried to do with the book was capture that, is that there isn't really a London, that there isn't really one approach, that it's, Mm. there are places that are highly segregated, places that aren't, places that are very mixed. You can have all these contradictory things in one person. You can have, you know, these very, very disparate experiences from people of the same backgrounds, you know, in the same house and the same, in the same street. In terms of like what the British political system needs, uh, I think that's a very different. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. a very different question. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you look at London now, and if you look at, I mean, there's also this sentence that what also struck me. It's Shafiullah tells me he wants to make English friends, but yeah. he hasn't managed. They have. There have only been a few times when he really spoke to some of the English. Yeah. I mean, that's quite illustrative for this segregation that's going on. Yeah. Do you think that? 
Um, how do you feel that in terms of, well, the whole, you can say migration might be one of the driving forces to Brexit. You can also say that this whole discussion in Brexit has done something with the yeah. ethnic relations in a city such as London. So it's complicated. Like, in terms of, to speak of the book and then to speak as mm -hmm. the yeah. as analyst, I, you know, when I, I interviewed hundreds of people for the, hundreds and hundreds of people. I spent so much time with people, with trying to work out how they saw London. And at first, I thought I was being a little, maybe a little bit anthropological. You know, let's go from the rich to the poor. Let's go from this ethnicity to that ethnicity and see what we get. And actually, as I compile the, the stories, the pattern that really emerged was actually age. And that all the stories of younger people had more in common, all the stories of middle-aged people, people with children and old people, and the book is arranged on this arc of life, which I think gives it, you know, narrative shape. Otherwise, it'd be completely incoherent. Like drive around London, and it's you get, you know, people's experiences of London really change very radically. From you arrive, you know, straight off the bus, immigration's a bit like, you know, sort of being born, like starting again. You know, then like Sheffield, like, you, you don't you don't know that many British people, but by the end of the the end of the journey, you know, these are people very enmeshed with very complicated, you know, stories and ties and, you know, leave. And the key turning point I found in these, these people that I profiled was, I would often ask this question, like, when did you feel you became English? And the answer was through children. And that when you have kids and they go to, uh, was your kid, in order to understand your kids, yeah. You have to immerse in that culture. The culture comes into the house. So that was... You also run into the system because you need to go yeah. apply to school for your... Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was, that was a trend. You know, it's interesting how, like, in people's working life, in the contemporary gig economy, that isn't really a force for integration that it was. So when I spoke to... This book is about London now, immigrants mm -hmm. now. If you... You know, when I interviewed some of the older ones from the previous generation, you, I'd be told about what it was like in the, these, these factories on the edge of London, where you had people from Jamaica and Ireland and you know, people from outside London all supporting the same football team, and they all sort of got along together. And though, those kind of big factories were factories also of a certain kind of British yeah. identity, which the gig economy like doesn't provide. It doesn't, it's just you on your, in your Uber, or on your delivery yeah. bike, or with your eight friends who work and you do your little plumbing business. That's not going to be an identity driver. Yeah, so the social element disappears and-, and, and that, you... that does, a bit of that does, yeah. yeah. But actually then, then what you do in your book is, is uh, there's another thing, there is the, the, the making visible of those who are to a certain group of people in London invisible, yes. but there's also the spatial element of, of, of being driven to the edges of the city uh, and, 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 and maybe the gentrification also that takes place in London. How do you see that right now developing? Is, is, is that something, well, it just is progressing or are there pushbacks? Well, it turns out like why, like, I think that when we, see, if we say, like, I was not really very interested in London when I was living in reporting on Russia, like, I didn't think about it very much. Like, I never expected to write a book on London. It, you know, in some ways, I'm not really sure how it happened. But when, if you'd asked me then, what's your image of London, I would have given you a response that would, pr would have been composed of a couple of elements. One would have probably been the property sections of the magazines. Can't believe this gentrification that's happening in Hackney. It's so expensive. Costume dramas, like, <laughs> you know, sort of, Pictures of the MPs, because I, pictures of the MPs, I see them. And then this, these sort of gangster movies or this sort of noir yeah. of a London of 40 years ago. And what all of those have in common is that they're pretty much all white spaces. Something I find very interesting is if you deny immigrant communities voice or the, you, you end up really not understanding the city at all where you live in. And I find it very interesting that Briti a lot of British kind of drama and a lot of yeah. you know, you know, Western drama in general can be very, very divorced from the actual experience of the city and can loop back into this endless nostalgia about what cities were like 
you know, back when the mafia was cool in the 70s and you had all the strip bars in the same joint. And it's, it's not writing about the city now because those stories are, uh, are immigrant stories. You know, so I, I, really wanted to, I really wanted to escape that. And I also felt that I just didn't know this place and I didn't know it, maybe I never knew it. Yeah. And I find it very, str I find there's a certain, you know, maybe it's, there's a certain sort of set, you know, maybe it's the polis from, uh, from you know, that sort of sense of, you, know, you would never say, you know the Netherlands in the way you go, oh, I know London. Yeah, yeah. How do you know it? You know, like six rooms. Like, what is your actual life? Like, you just sort of you take a piece of public transport in the morning, you drive your car from your office back home, and then you spend the evening like being rude to your friends on Facebook. Like, you don't yeah. know London. Yeah, you don't yeah. know London. And I, I find that I, I just, you know, I, I feel I very much laboured under the impression that I did, yeah. and it was only the experience of going to be a foreign correspondent which led me to realise. Yeah. You know, the sort of disjuncture. Some critics might have said, well, you got to know London, but you only saw the gloomy part. Well, yeah, people have said that. And I was like really very, I was really very surprised when people said that. Because if you look at the, the characters in the book, as they say, <laughs> these are not characters, these are real people, and they're doing yeah. what they're doing in the book right now. You know, one of these, one of these guys came as an immigrant from Nigeria didn't have the right paperwork, and he's now a senior police officer. Like, that is a pretty good job. Like, he may not be a, he may not be a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a book reviewer for the Telegraph, but he is, he has succeed, you know, the, he has really succeeded. Like, they equate of, them to unsuccessful. I was really yeah. shocked about that. Like, yeah. one of the, the people in the, in the book is a, you know, Polish migrant that has a flat in Warsaw, flat in France, house in London, construction business. He's got a huge turnover. Yes, he works with his hands. Yeah, if yeah. you think his life is gloomy, I'm, yeah. I'm really, I was really surprised that that wasn't, uh, I don't, I hadn't, you know, I think that people have got very, very narrow, these reviewers, that sort of commentary out class has got quite a narrow. In that sense, you might've gotten confirmed that there is a distance and a yeah, well, I, yeah. yeah, I was, I was just surprised. I was surprised about that. Yeah. You know, like one of these people is like a, you know, a successful mental health professional. Yeah. And he's like a senior personality in the medical community. Like, yeah. gloomy, miserable. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so like, have you, by the way, kept in touch with some of them? I have kept in touch with them. Some of them became, became friends. Some of them, some of them I know what they're, some of them know what they're doing. One or two of them disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. Um, yeah, no. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the situations pretty. A lot of the situations pretty similar. Hmm. Um, you know, all, all the people I'm in touch with, like these questions of Brexit and identity, are very, yeah, very important to them. You know, one thing that interviewing these, this scope of of people from immigrant backgrounds was, is that how, you know, they felt that London had been transformed by immigration in their, yeah. in their, in their being there, that they were surprised by the pace of change. And I don't think it's, you know, like I spoke a lot about this being a moment of real like historical transformation in London and in Britain. And you could think that's a very far right opinion. I. I don't think it is. I think you can only reach, you know, sort of progressive conclusions about how to report, how to redesign public services, how to represent Britain in a fairer way by recognising that we've really moved into being a new country. And in terms of, you know, this book's applicability to the rest of the, you know, to, to, to Amsterdam, like, you know, I do think that you could write the same book about hmm. Amsterdam, you could write the same book about Cologne, you could write it about Rome, and they would be completely different, but they would, you know, the core yeah. of it would be, be the same. Yeah. yeah. These are, these are, I think these are very new cities in terms of how people live them. Yeah. That's a good bridge to our next guest, but at first, I, w I want one last question maybe, sure. because, because uh, in, in your answers, quite rightfully so, you make a distinction between the book and now you yeah. being asked European, I, and that's and that's I think 
rightfully so, because there's a difference. But at the same time, your book um, um, describes, and, and also the articles afterwards, how migration was a driving force for Brexit. So you're being pulled into that discussion, I think, not only by me, but by many people who ask you now, how do you listen to it? How no, I'm, I'm there for the Brexit, the Brexit conversation. But it's, how do I think about, how do I think about, uh, how do I think about Brexit? Like, I, I think that... <laughs> Can there be a broader question? Yeah. yeah um, I'm trying to think of a kind of fun, <laughs> fun, uh, pithy answer for you. Um, I think that it is a mistake to view this as a British crisis. I think that, well, obviously, this, there is a peculiar and only in the UK political crisis. I think that the trends, the kind of politics, the kind of ideas, the kind of resentments, you see that yeah. in many, if not all, European countries, and that there is a collective European issue right now, and only in Britain has it reached this, this, fever, this fever pitch. Yeah. And I think that the intensity of the debate the, fur the, the furious argument of both sides in the UK has been so intense that it has, to a certain extent, clouded that there are very serious issues in France, Italy. You know, the polls are pretty interesting here. And I, there's been a tendency in the last, like it was interesting at first, but then like most of these journalistic tendencies, it became a, gone a bit too far, is there's a tendency to, there's a narrative that's developed of this sort of fool Britannia narrative that it is because of the British Empire, or it's because of, it's only happened because of Eton or because of these public schools or because of Boris Johnson. And I think that that kind of misses the point and that you have hard right populism driven by immigration really like in most countries in the uh, in the in the western world and you have a sudden turn into often quite violent politics through the social media dimension yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again and i think that's been a bit too overdone and i think it actually ascribes way too much power to this tiny coterie of British ruling class politicians. And the flip side of that, which I notice in European, I notice in European commentators, is to say that Brexit is stupid. And I voted Remain. I would, would very much like to vote Remain again. I don't know if I'll be able to, hmm. but I don't think that the question of immigration, borders, yeah. political size, is it better to be a big block or a smaller country, control? I, I don't think these are stupid questions. I think these are the questions. We shouldn't be 20th. distracted by the simple analysis that... Sure. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. no. I, do, I just think that those are the questions yeah. of the 21st century. And I think that most European countries are arguing about them. And it's only in the UK through the referendum mechanism, which is, you know, it's very much part of the British constitution now, but as Margaret Thatcher said, it was a tool of demagogues. Has it ended up yeah. in this particular yeah. format? Well, I, I think you quite eloquently said that this is also a European problem or something that plays in other European cities who might uh, invite our second guest then to maybe enlarge in the discussion a little bit. Um, his name is Cody Hochstenbach. He's a postdoctoral researcher in urban geography at the University of Amsterdam, specializes in social and spatial inequality and the politics of housing. Welcome, Cody. Yes, um, thank you. You are a man of statistics. Mm -hmm. You're a researcher. How, how do you then listen or read or reflect on the book of a man who tries to get the stories out there and across? Well, I should emphasize I'm not only a man of no. statistics. Um, <laughs> You're my, more than that. Yeah. In my research and in my work, I do try to emphasize the long-term structural trends. So I like to be able to say we have this much social housing in this year and it's gone up or it's gone down 
has gone down over the last couple of years. So these are the big structural trends. But what I think that uh, Ben does very well in his book, This is London, is to deal with a population that's indeed not captured by these statistics. These are undocumented migrants, for example. By definition, they won't show up in the statistics I have to rely on. Still, the same structural forces might apply in relation to um, housing market liberalization, for example. So Ben manages to reach these populations. That's one. A second thing is he manages to capture the stories of these people. So with statistics, you only get pretty anonymous numbers, right? And Ben describes the lives of people and actually made friends with them, I just learned. Um, so it gets a face, and uh, these stories are, I think, very important if you want to emphasize the, the political yeah. importance and also the, how it impacts, the deep impact it has on people's lives. So I think you definitely need these ethnographic uh, insights, I would say, to understand the broader yeah. structural patterns you can capture with uh, statistics. And of course, one thing Ben has paid perhaps less attention uh, to in his, in his talk just now, is that statistics can also be used to, for political purposes. So to indeed to lie with uh, statistics, yeah. which is a common, commonly used phrase, right? Yeah. So if we pick up on the, on, on the note we left with how we shouldn't um, um, reduce everything to just uh, Brexit and say that's stupid without talking about underlying currency of, of tendencies and developments. How do you listen to uh, Ben talking about London in comparison to other European cities, maybe even Amsterdam? I mean, in Amsterdam, if you talk about the housing market and someone mm -hmm. says, we are turning into London, people go berserk, <laughs> almost. So that's like the, the horror scenario, people, mm -hmm. then. How do, you, how, do you, how do you listen to that? Well, one thing is that if you look at the academic literature in my field, in urban geography and urban studies, the experiences from England and from the United States, and specifically from London and New York, tend to be very, very dominant. So actually, in my field, I'm pretty used to the idea of London and New York being sort of the gold standard, and other cities are sort of fit into the model of these cities. Um, and that's a bit uncomfortable, of course, because each city is unique, and each city has different trajectories. London is far from a re representative case uh, of cities across the world or even of Europe, but it is very dominant in knowledge production and dominant in the way we view cities all across the world, I would say. Um, one thing that does ring true to me is the fact that major cities, capital cities especially, Amsterdam, London, Barcelona, Berlin, the experiences in those cities are to a certain degree synchronizing, I would say. So the problems Amsterdam is facing are probably more similar to the problems in London and in Barcelona than they are somewhere in the periphery of the country here. So I do think there's a synchronization of uh, experiences in these uh, capitals, capital cities. And you also see that um, political leaders of these cities are sort of bonding together to find common solutions for the problems they share. So our local government here in Amsterdam is involved in this rebel cities network, for example, where they cooperate with Barcelona, where they try to deal with um, different issues yeah. relating to gentrification, indeed, um, tourism, and other, other topics. Yeah, yeah. Ben, do you, do you share the same analysis? That, that, that because, because what's interesting is that, at, at, at the one hand, cities are synchronizing, and at the other hand, you just pointed out we shouldn't make the easy distinction that you have London and the rest of Britain, because you have people commuting into London, you can't say London is just the city. Yeah, well, I just think that you've got to, you, when, I just think that you've got to be really, really suspicious of categorizing the country into very neat political tribes. I don't think that actually mm. matches up with how people live or how people think or even what, what, the, da what the data is. <laughs> like, in terms of are uh, the experiences of the big cities synchronizing? Well, yes, they definitely are. And that's not because of the cities themselves, it's because of the free movement of capital. And that in the, you know, from 
very much from the 1980s where you have the full, the final sort of integration of uh, Western capital capital markets and synchronize, you know, instantaneous money transfer. You have national capitals property markets, which basically open up into a pan-Western asset class. And I think that's a key driver mm-hmm. of why these experiences are synchronizing. And the asset that is a house in Kensington or a brownstone in the Upper East Side has synchronized. And that's not, that's not mm. because of you know, that's because of capital mark. That's because of a uh, of financial mark of finance itself. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. But then we can talk about ethnic relations. But maybe it's more about class. One of the things that's really interesting about ethnic relations. One of the things that's really interesting that's happening at the moment. Is, and again, it's like you've got to be really suspicious of trends. Is if you look at the the data. Well, I'm not an expert to analyze the data. We keep pointing but, to Cody but, when but you say be, data. Be, okay, be, yeah. be, look, be looking at it. Is that since 2014 in the US, since the Ferguson uh, events, and how this sort of interaction of social, me- social media, these clips of these poor guys just being killed for like, smoking a cigarette on the street corner, reached millions of... Uh, 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 of Americans, there's been, there's been what they call the great awakening of a shift amongst Democratic voters in the US to being much more concerned about racial justice, much more concerned as a result that was like a gateway drug into talking of questions, rethinking questions of race, gender, mm-hmm. um, sexuality, like changing norms. And I think that, that that's a very unexpected journey that, the, that a very large number of white American liberals have gone on that wouldn't have been easily predicted by the, politi- the politics of 2000, 2010. And I think we shouldn't, you know, we should always be suspicious of extrapolating trends. Like one thing in the UK, that's been interesting, and it's a very fierce debate in Westminster about why, is if you look at public concern about immigration, takes off and it rockets in the run-up to 2016. So a couple of theories of why. I think it's an interplay of all three, but that's that's also the cop-out answer. First is that simply the numbers of immigrants arriving every year increased dramatically. As a result, the reporting on them increased, and then this sense of confusion, fear of uh, kicked off. If you look at the next election after the 2017 election, public concern about immigration collapses. So politicians in Westminster are very divided as to why. Some of them go, well, the concern about immigration collapsed because people felt it had been fixed, that the borders were coming up, job done, you know, Brexit's coming, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We can now, you know, a lot of voters went back to the Labour Party, or went back to the Conservative Party, having been with UKIP or having been elsewhere. Another opinion is that the media narrative just changed, moved away from immigration and moved on to... Brexit itself, the enemy, the enemy changed mm. from in this reporting. So I think that's a very interesting. That's a very interesting. Question that I don't really, I don't really have the answer. Yeah, I don't really have the the answer yeah. to. Yeah. How, how do you listen to that, Cody? To migration in 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 the sense that the attention, well, the explanations differ. But mm-hmm. but how do you look at that in in maybe European context or Dutch context? Well, I think if you want to understand the right, the, sorry, the rise of right-wing populism, and I guess you could maybe also count the Brexit as an example of it. It's maybe a bit tricky uh, to say so, um, but I think if you want to understand the rise of these political parties on the right, 
you can't do without and um, without take, paying attention to migration and I, w I would also call it xenophobia and racism basically you need to take those um, elements into account when you want to understand the prominence of these political parties but of course these concerns people ha are having are not new so I think the Netherlands was one of the first countries to have like a mature right-wing populist party with Pim Fortuyn here, mm. um, which was already voicing those concerns. And um, they became more dominant, I think, around 2015, when you saw a lot of refugees entering Europe. And after that, even when the numbers went down again, it sort of stayed right in the center of debate. And I think you do need to understand it if you want to understand the political regimes all across, all across Europe and all... Yeah. I guess also the Brexit vote. So I think you can make a pretty good left-wing progressive case against the European Union because the European Union is quite a technocratic organization. It is an organization that serves the interests of free markets and the power of capital over the power of labor, so to say. Um, but it's been fueled by these concerns about migration and also about racist concerns, I would say. Um, I don't think, by the way, that Brexit will deliver on a promise of a more progressive uh, left-wing agenda, only if you look at already, you know, you mentioned Boris Johnson or Nigel Farage, an investment banker from the City of London, so it's obvious they won't um, deliver on the idea of a more progressive alternative to European yeah. Union. It's my, that will be my take. Um, well, it's like high noon right now in the Labour Party about this argument's happening, it's, ha it's happening right now. In terms of like how Brexit has changed my mind, I think that I, uh, I think I was correct to think that it would be a very humbling and chaotic and fragilizing experience for the British ruling class and for the British state and for you know very much risking the union between England and Scotland and the position of Northern Ireland. At the time, however, I think I had a much rosier picture of the power politics of the European Union. And I think that you know watching Brexit unfold has made me think to what extent this particular like, art of war, which has been developed in Brussels, which is using these cliff edges to place extreme pressure yeah. on Greece, on Italy, on Poland, now on the UK, uh, is something I feel quite queasy about. And I think that the, this technique, as is now being deployed, in particular on Ireland, Northern Ireland, the UK. I feel quite, I feel quite uncomfortable about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, this particular attitude, I think, which has developed amongst officials in the Commission and bleeding into the French and German establishments. It's a private conversation, of course. <laughs> yeah. Is <laughs> that the European Union almost only exists or is only strong in these conf in these cliff edge scenarios? Is something I'm. I'm quite uncomfortable with. But would there be another way? I... I feel... I feel quite... I feel like a lot of things I feel unhappy about right now, politically. <laughs> yes, especially in Israel. But the... Um, I th in some ways, there are quite, quite neat parallels between the French and their approach to the European Union and the British. The, what we saw with Macron is this idea, all the European Union needs is this really strong advocate to come in, job done, fix up the institutions, the European Union can be saved. All you need is like very, very clear, developed plans. And I think Macron shows that the European Union is really difficult to, to reform. And that has really checked my enthusiasm for a lot of political projects that when I see them, yeah. I might agree with a lot of their principles, like the, D, the DM25 manifesto, a lo lovely document. I think it's a bit too far 
Varoufakis is, is one of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's a complicated politician, but the ideas, I think, are... The ideas in that manifesto are very nice. It's just a little bit... I just don't believe anymore. What do you like about it? I mean... Oh, in terms of... Well, I like the way that they want to create more redistributive, redistributive institutions in Europe, and they want to reform the European Central Bank, and they want to use, mm. they want to use these Brussels institutions to create a fairer Europe and a greener Europe. Yeah, yeah. That I like, but it's just, it's just so far away from what can politically be achieved with Brussels that I couldn't say I identify with it politically. Mm. So I think that the parallel of Macron's approach to, to you know, trying to be this white knight for the European Union is the, is the British approach, which is that you know, it's easy to leave and that all you need to do is just walk out of the, walk, walk, to the, walk to the door and they'll try and make you come in because you're the hero after all. I think that the English and French experience is quite, inter is quite interesting. I have been thinking a lot about the question of Germany and I, I, I go back and forth on this between thinking that it's, it's become very fashionable, in, especially in America, to be anti-German. It's very acceptable in polite society. And I, I go back and forth between thinking that that's not good and between thinking that actually what Macron shows is that you need a more confrontational approach to achieve results. With with Germany, that's something I, I'm mm. thinking about. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's good we're in a private conversation than saying yeah, well, the, the English well, and the French are. are. <laughs> um, Cody, I think two words that keep coming back are detachment and identification with your city, with European Union, with politics. Do you feel like? Um, because we've actually been talking about London and what we didn't see about London or how we didn't know the city. Do you see that in, in, in cities such as Amsterdam? If you wrote, this is Amsterdam? <laughs> you will probably end up with, indeed, a pretty similar but completely different book, uh, yes. like you mentioned. <laughs> um, because uh, we tend to forget this, but also in the Netherlands, the number of homeless people has increased by 70% over the last six or seven years. So there's an immense increase. So you could also document their lives. Um, you could also document the lives of people being forced to live in trailer parks or holiday homes or garden sheds, moustaches, uh, which would also show you the precarity among people living in Amsterdam and working in Amsterdam. Because if you look, if you walk through Amsterdam and look at the city, it all feels very clean, it all feels very sterile, and you don't notice the, the poverty in there and the, the, the pretty sharp trade-offs people have to make to be able to stay in Amsterdam and live here and work here. But even though we're pretty good, I would say, in the Netherlands in sort of hiding it, at least out of middle class sight, and most of us will probably belong to the middle classes, these stories are there. Um, I'm not quite sure if they're there to the same extent as they are in London. And maybe one related thing I was thinking about during your presentation, because we've talked a bit about Brexit and how that relates to your findings, but after you wrote your book and published the book, of course, you had the Grenfell Tower incident yes. where, what was it, 70 something people died in uh, the huge fire and they were living, in, they were crammed actually into in a highly flammable building. Has that sort of increased awareness about the topics you're discussing or not at all? Because this really put it in the spotlight, right, in London, in yeah. England, but also in Europe and the rest of the world. Well, so I feel that the book was written in the shadow of Brexit yet to come, in the cold that I could feel of that shadow, and also in the shadow of Grenfell. I didn't realise what I was writing about, and when I saw these two events, it sort of, sort of made sense when my intuition had, uh, had taken me. And I think that the, the story of Grenfell Tower is, it's, you know, the failure of the regulatory state. Mm -hmm. Is that you, you had a tower, there was social housing in the tower, you had these people receiving, you know, large amounts of them receiving government support, but there was no, very, very weak or no effective regulation to make sure you didn't have overcrowding 
or fire hazard. And, and I think that you know, a lot of those themes, I, I, I could feel them intuitively like in the research I did through the DOS houses of, uh, through the DOS houses of, um, uh, of London. In terms of like where the public mood is in the UK, I, one of the interesting things about Brexit is that the Brexit, the referendum happened and then politics in a way continued with the theme of before, which was austerity and the winners and losers of this crisis epoch of British capitalism. And the Labour Party responded by the Re Labour Party responded by re-electing as its leader after Brexit, a leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who was, would have been a pretty good campaigner. Obviously, there are lot, lots of problems with Jeremy Corbyn, but he was the right campaigner for opposing David Cameron, but perhaps not for the Brexit era. Hmm. And the Labour Party movement hadn't anticipated or understood that Britain was entering into a period where, like the Victorian age, where everything will be defined by Brexit. So the mood of 2017, Grenfell Tower came right after the election, Brexit had kicked off a discussion about inequality, the left behind, that reached a sort of fever pitch, lasted into 2018. Now, the national conversation is, you know, Brexit has become real and the national conversation is very much about that. Something that I, I'm quite unsettled by. So I just saw on, so tonight I saw on Twitter that there had been a production of Richard the Richard the Second in London, and where Richard the Second goes in the great Shakespeare play, sort of England, which wants to conquer others, have made a shameful conquest of itself. The whole audience like erupted into laughter and claps. It's a very emotional moment, and I think that in a way that's not particularly tethered to reality, there's this intense emotion now of national humiliation, which I feel very uncomfortable about. Firstly, because if you, the, if you look at the British economy has actually continued, obviously Brexit hasn't happened, but the economy mm. that's doing worse right now is actually the German economy. The French, German growth is lower down. French unemployment is higher up. The UK's problems are a lot of them the problems it had before. There's a lot of trapped investment in the UK. It would do, if you had an agreement, it would do better. There's been so much emotion put on this issue over the Irish backstop, which at the end of the day is about a form of customs check for live animal goods between in the Irish Sea. The emotions have gone quite quite far out of control there. And I am quite unsettled because I see this very, very big spread of a desire for this humiliation to be put right, which is shared by Remainers and is shared by Brexiteers. And I worry that the next 10 years could see a lot of just like rubbish, like the Great British Antarctica expedition to like prove oh, yeah, to the world yeah. Yeah. or pointless you know, sort of 10,000 troops to show Hoping that we can do it. Or maybe, yeah, to win the Europe. Mm, I think yeah. a bit more, I think there'd be a little bit more, yeah, and I don't, I don't like that. And I saw yeah. these polls that come through yeah. today that yeah. there was a desire for a strong leader. So I think that we will end up, well, not too long, we're a prime minister that will rule yeah. for 10 years. And I'm be interesting to see who that is and... Maybe what then to, to, to conclude this and then go to the audience, this self-humiliation -humili and um, maybe I'm making a far stretch, but then you correct me. Oh. It, it kind of reminds me maybe a little bit of what you describe in Fragile Empire. I mean, uh, the, the uh, yeah. self-humiliation and, and trying to regain pride. Is there some parallel which you've seen in both books? Uh, you... Like what? There, there's a little. There's a little bit. There's there's a tiny comparison which you can make, which is the British political and media cl class. The like a chunk of it which didn't understand what it was attempting, 
ended up dominating that. You know, the, the previous government and the majority of that class did understand and very much opposed this decision. And there is a loose comparison, very loose comparison with 1990, 1991. In terms of like the, the Soviet economy and society just imploded. Yeah. And I am uh, as, as sad as I am about the cancelling of certain car manufacturing plants in parts of parts of England. It's not comparable, and I think the fact that we'd even make that comparison shows how tempers and emotions yeah. Yeah. are distant. In terms of where it will lead, I think there's a comparison, which is I have noticed from talking to French uh, French and Brussels officials, there is this view there that you can have your cake and eat it, which is either Brexit will happen and the boot would have been stamped on it so other people won't try, or it won't happen and Britain will stay in the European Union somehow, and then we'll get back to, to business. It will be over. But in the same way that the British political class doesn't realise that Brexit is forever, You'll be arguing about your relationship with the continent for the rest of your lives. I don't think that the European political establishment has realised that this anti-European political force in the UK is also forever. And I was speaking to French sort of whisperers, like Macron whisperers that were being sent to Washington to sort of whisper. And they were telling me, oh, well, just go into no deal. Just go in. Just go in for a, for a bit. And then you'll come back, and we've got a great deal for you in terms of security participation. And I just couldn't believe that I was hearing this, that the, there is this belief that the UK could be pushed into this situation, and then two years down the road, presumably a Conservative government would come back and be happily doing mm. security cooperation again with, with France in the way that it was before. I, I, just, yeah. I don't think that's how things work. I think if that happened these emotions of humiliation and this nationalist feeling of the Conservative Party will get worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any questions? People who've heard something they want to yeah. come to you and then I come to you. Um, thanks, Ben. I didn't find This Is London at all gloomy, by the way. I oh, found thank it you. Awesome. very life-affirming in its honesty and its integrity. Um, but I've got to pick up with you on your fairly um, sanguine view towards Brexit. The Northern Irish border issue, I mean, I remember what that was like in, in the 80s. I, I lived in, in, in Northern Ireland. It's a lot more than live animal products. Um, you, you seem to... I share your view that there's, I don't like the full Britannia narrative. I have to face it almost every bloody day here living in the Netherlands as a Brit, and I get very tired of it. There's a lot more Brexit in the Netherlands than, and, uh, than most people realise. But it doesn't change the fact that whether it's a response to the dark side of globalisation or immigration or whatever, you, it's a very, very foolish response, I believe. I would want your reflection on that. Just as a backstop, I, I do... I, I think the European Union took the wrong approach here. And I, I think that they bungled, they bungled their, their diplomacy around it. And I think by trying to turn it into this like, point of humiliation, they, that triggered this political crisis. I, I just think that in terms of I think that emotions have gone a bit too high about it. You know, I just, I, I think that they've placed sovereignty demands on the UK, which the UK can't meet or can't meet sustainably. I just, I just, I, it's just when I, you know, I've been watching BBC Parliament and seeing these MPs get up one after the other and. You know, I don't think it is, I don't think the situation there is, even if one did enter the backstop, as, you know, I don't think it's not a Treaty of Versailles. It's not a, and I think too many people like the Marc Francois of, of this, of that house uh, are talking about it like that. So that's where I, that's why I might, uh, you're right to pick me up on being a bit flippant about it, and I, I shouldn't have done that, but it's, yeah, that's my, 
that's my view that in terms of like the Netherlands and its approach to Brexit, I notice a lot, and I, I understand it, but that Brexit has become this like cultural moment for a certain Brussels liberal. And it's uh, and sort of enjoying it and sort of <laughs> pretending not to understand it and pretending it's only a, a British thing. And I find that really I find that really annoying. Yeah, yeah. And I know, that seems to be quite high here. Whereas in France, that's, things could not be more different. Yeah. And I think that you know, it's very much taken very, almost too seriously in, in France. I think that there's a sort of, you, you, see, you see a lot of that here. And I think that's, you know, I, I, I'm very curious to find out here more about the Mark Rutte era and what, what comes after it. And hmm. you know, to what extent I've been trying to find out like to what extent does could Dutch politics go 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 British after yeah. <laughs> this gentleman's departure to this of the, from the sea or departure to, yeah. to Brussels? So it's my my do questions you, for you. Do you recognise that, Cody? The, the the way Ben is a bit well surprised by how maybe people keep talking about Brexit as. Well, I've been wondering about it. The. Brexit, whether it's also not the, the, the sort of collective hysteria, whether it's also not partly manufactured. I, I don't mean this in a conspiracy theory kind of way, but don't get me wrong. Um, but I think Brexit is some sort of crisis in politics, or it's, it's like a shock, I would say. And we know that these shocks are often seized as an opportunity by big corporation and private interest to push through their agenda, right? That's what Naomi Klein describes in the shock doctrine in her book. Um, and I can, I, I can see it happening that Brexit opens this window of opportunity to advance capitals and private interests uh, by stripping environmental regulation, by um, dismantling the National Health, Health Service, um, by welcoming foreign property investors, actually, maybe not from Europe. Um, and that also relates, I guess, to your point about the regulatory state failing or falling short. Um, so I think, I think you, the, the interest for Brexit might relate to this point. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I'm speculating here. Yeah, there's a question here. Um, yeah, I'm moving away a bit from Brexit back to the, um, um, I think to the book. I oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, about the, you, you talked about this, um, uh, this trend in media to have these little safaris, right? Yes. Um, so to go, for, for example, to Trump country or maybe to another country, probably go there for just one day and just you know, talk to people and then uh, write a story about how the people think in village X or Y. Um, but usually it's just for one day, and I've had to do some of these stories myself as well to uh, spend one day on the streets of Athens or something and then describe how the Greeks think. Um, so my question is, how would you approach this? Because um, I just randomly spoke to some people I found on the street. I tried to find an old person, a young person, you know, uh, a person in the shop, um, maybe some person in an office. But it's a very small sample, so obviously your story is going to be colored very much by um, the five or six people that you talk to. So how do you, how can you do representative safaris? Okay, so two, two, point, two points here. One is, I, the reason that one would criticize journalists going to do these portraits of towns and what people think who's, is the only reason to criticize it if they're only doing one type. And I think that there shouldn't be less of them, there should be more of the others. Because one of the things I noticed in the long Brexit media situation is that there have been incredibly few portraits of the wealthy remain towns and what's going on there psychologically, the wealthy leave towns, and there's just been a, a class stereotype there. So I think that it's... I want more of all, not, I just don't want it to be a kind of stereotype in that. You don't want it to be a, become a classist stereotype. In terms of like vox popping, I, well, I've done so much of this. I, I, in terms of vox popping, I, 
sometimes it's interesting. I, 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 covered, I covered a British election for Politico. So I went to all these towns, these little portraits of these towns, and I tried to turn it into a little bit of a joke. So I decided, okay, I'm going to vox pop 100 people, and I'm going to ask them a poll. So I thought these little unscientific polls were sort of amusing way of doing this. And then I was trying to work out, like, what are these people telling me? And often trying to work out if the town had a particular opinion or if I was hearing these basically sound bites from the newspapers or from TV or from politicians. So that's an interesting question to, that's an interesting question to ask. In terms of, like, trying to find things that are not, you know, that are not not representative in that way. With the London book, you know, there are I can't remember how many chapters there there are in it, but there there are not three hundred. And I did I think interview three hundred people. And what you don't have in the book are all of the people that told me to get lost. I don't want to talk to you, or they were boring, or they we didn't get on, or they stormed out of the interview, or. They never wanted to go on record or, or, or whatever. And what all of those people have in common is that they could tell the story of their own lives. You know, they're all storytellers. They all, they all had this thing to, to say. Yes. And it's, you know, I met people with incredible lives that I would go, well, tell me about this, this incredible moment. And they'd go, yeah, it was stressful. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, so that's, how did I find these people? It's, a lot of the answer came through guides. And if you were going to go to a remote place or even a familiar place, I, you would need a, you'd need a guide. So there were, and you notice the book is actually dedicated to these two, two friends of mine who were very much guides into Eastern European and African London. So they're there at the front or the back, I can't remember. Yeah. And I think that's a good way to do it. A, lately, a reporting technique which I have used, perhaps going against what, people, what you're supposed to do, is there is so much stuff, so much stuff going on on Facebook, particularly of people in their 30s and 40s <laughs> ranting at each other in... But in in forums, so just a, just an example of a story that both myself and a friend were interested in in the U.S. There's been a hmm. there's this anti-vax issue. There'd been a measles outbreak in a town of very religious, you know, a lot of them Hasidic Jews. If you went there, as this friend of mine did try and do vox pops, talk to the rabbi, okay? Nothing, so you have to come back. If you go on Facebook, they're, they're all there screaming at each other, like in yeah, open yeah. groups about, yeah. so that's a sort of, you know, there's a, you can do a lot of that. In terms of something where I think we need more journalism is YouTube. I think there's just, there's not enough writing about YouTube and what's going on on YouTube and how it, what YouTube has done to our culture because if I type in like Arab music, was I like that? And then two minutes later, I've got a f I'm being advertised on the carousel, some far right politician. You know, I think that, or a 9 11 conspiracy theory, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. And to, just short before I go to you, do you also notice that because your type of journalism for This Is London yes. is rather time consuming? Um, yes, it was extremely tough. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, do you see that afterwards in the newsrooms you work or in political or whatever, that uh, the editor-in-chief or whatever makes more time for journalists? Because in the end, it comes down to that. Are you going to write uh, the column in three hours or are you going to dive in three well, weeks? I've, had a very, I've been very, very lucky and I've had like, quite a strange little journey through, for, uh, quite a strange journey. So I, you know, I've... I've I've never worked for a newspaper. I've never worked for a newspaper. I've always been, yeah. I've always been kind of freelance, like sort of, sort of doing my doing my own, doing my own thing and doing these books. And in terms of like how I keep myself afloat, like I, I have not actually kept myself afloat through through journalism. I've done that through really really you know quite technical think tank work, like a lot of it to do with like anti money laundering legislation or yeah. things to do with the the. The, with a fragile empire, which I'm glad I uh, got to mention this evening. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> my, yeah, my book on Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> you have a question. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I would like to know, uh, you studied these people, these 600,000 that were in London, these uh, immigrants who are not yes. documented. Yes. Um, is it not for all the times that there are a group of people in a society who is not documented? Well, that, there are two really, really interesting things in that, in that question. Well, obviously, for most of human history, nobody's documented. Like, there's no, and like the, 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 you know, documentation, its relationship to the power of the modern state, and, you know, we can go into so many exciting philosophical ways by way of Foucault into that, that biopolitics. It's, and like the, the illusion that the state should be capable of documenting everybody, I find, I find sort of interesting. In terms of like London history, I, as I researched London history, I was struck by how London had been far less of an immigrant city than I thought it had. And that, you know, because my family are on both sides, uh, an immigrant family and my grandparents are immigrants and of, on one side quite exotic and on one side quite mundane Jewish immigrants. I assume that our experience was a lot more widespread when they came to the UK in the early and mid 20th century. And I was really stunned to see the very, very low results for foreign born in London in the 1930s. Stunned. You know, these, these figures of 3% being foreign born. Mm -hmm. And if you go back, if you do the research backwards, I was you know, really struck by how small the Jewish immigration to London was between 1880 and 1920, a quarter of a million people, which is really not very much, over the entire period. And then if you look at the high point of Irish migration to the UK, obviously that's not immigration, it's migration. But in the mid 19th century after the potato famine, the highest point of that ethnic rate was 3%. I was very struck by that as well. And if one goes back to the previous largest wave to have impact on the UK, the Huguenot migration from this part of the world and further, further south, there was never more than 1% of the population of London. So that, that struck me. So yes, there was always an immigrant London with its secrets unknown. You know, my family were in it, but it's... I, I was surprised by how small it was. As I went further back into English history, and I, I use that word, I choose to say that, England is different from France, Germany, you know, from the Netherlands in this respect, is that you have these mass migrations during the Dark Ages, and then pretty much a period where you have next very, very little immigration until the time of Shakespeare. And this was a, a country which expelled the entire Jewish presence in the 13th century, where there was no Jewish presence until the time of Cromwell. It's quite extraordinary if you think of this, yeah. you think of that historically, you compare it to the rest of Europe, and you do, we do have, of course, there were, Saracen traders and there were Lombard bankers, of course. I, they were a relatively small amount, and this was not a cosmopolitan island, you know, and it was not at the center of European civilization either, you know, until for this core part of medieval, this core part of medieval uh, uh, history. Yeah. <laughs> Cody, do you think in Amsterdam, um, um, the question actually, you can't, isn't it just a fact of life that you can't document in every big city, everyone who comes there? How's the situation in Amsterdam? We have some undocumented people there also. Well, what I found interesting in Ben's answer was that you mentioned 3% a couple of times. And I think there's these studies which show that for the last decades or maybe even centuries, I'm not quite sure, Globally, about 3% of the population is on the move, and that's, that is pretty stable, that figure, over time. You, should, you don't see a mass increase. Of course, you see some fluctuation, and they go to different places or move from different places, but the 3% is pretty stable over, over longer stretches of time. Um, and I, 
That's really interesting. I also agree with uh, Ben's thanks point that um, I think being undocumented only becomes problematic when the state exercises control through making populations legible, right? Being able to to see them in the statistics and redistributing them across space or whatever. So being undocumented only becomes problematic when when the state and its functioning depends on this. Um, of course, you do also see undocumented migrants in, in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, but I would say indeed it's also still a pretty yeah. small percentage and it's, it's very difficult to compare this over longer stretches of, yeah. of time. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. I saw one question there. Is there someone else? It's really, it's really interesting also. Yeah, I come to you. Maybe make it free if the answers are a bit uh, short so we can make it free. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation, Ben. Thank um, you. A lot has been said, of course, about migration this evening and its impact on uh, uh, population and sentiment and uh, populism. What you didn't mention, and perhaps that's something to be optimistic about, is the anti-Islam sentiment. It's amazing that an evening that was so much about migration that the word Islam has not even been mentioned yet. How much of that did you come across or how little of it? So, I, so because of my name, I'm always wearing a kippah. Like there's no hiding it, it's like I'm, you know, everybody, they all met Ben Judah. You know, there was no, they didn't, they didn't, you know, there was, so the whole book is mediated through that. So people either, that's, I was very aware of that and that was, at times that was difficult. Like I wanted to interview an imam for, for the book. I found loads of mosques, no, don't want to speak to him. I got people to call for me. No, don't want to speak to you. And finally, I did do a portrait of somebody from uh, a mosque, but it took a, it took a long time. So, it, in terms of like, what, you know, I didn't want people when they, when I sat down to interview them, to feel that they had to respond to these media narratives in the press. I want I went to these people like, I want to do a portrait of you. Tell me about your life and how you've experienced life in London. And clash of civilizations style experiences extremely seldomly came up. Mm. Even if these people were Muslim or they married Muslims or they were it just didn't really come up. Mm. In terms like the things that it came up a bit, but like not, not very much. Like the stories that did come up that I was surprised by is when I was asking these people to tell me about themselves, people very quickly, not quickly, but people want, talked a lot about their personal faith. And I was not expecting this journey and these profiles to, to, take, to, to take me into so many places where people are talking about their own relationship with God or their own relationship with hope in that way. I obviously don't know whether that's, is that me? Because I'm questioning them and I'm religious. Is that me? Are they responding to something in me? Is that, if you look at the statistics, London has actually become more religious in the last 20 years. You have a higher rate of church building, you have a flourishing, especially uh, black church movement in London. The immigrant city is much more religious than the, the, sort of, than the, the Cockney city, which it's fused with. And I found that, I found, I found, I found that, I found that interesting. I, one thing that these there one thing that I find that the sort of narrative of someone like Douglas Murray or these narratives, which are basically replacement narratives, 
does not meet, they don't look like reality, is that what I like to think the book shows is that people are not living their daily lives, even though they might at times be very segregated, in these like greens over here, blues over there, ethnic blocks. That they don't, there are places where people do live like that, in Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, but that's, there was a lot more, there's a lot more like fluidity into marriage, a lot, a lot, lot, lot more of that yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, the, the, than these civilizational. There's a lot, there's a lot, there's as much fusion as there is clash in what I, what I saw. And I think that there are a lot more, you know, I, the, the book contains like a lot of these portraits of these bi ethnic, multi ethnic families because that was what I was seeing. Uh, I saw a lot more of that than I did confrontation. And one thing that I was surprised of during this journey was how distinct what I was seeing was from the front page of the Daily Mail. And the distinctions there were was, like there, there is an impression of enormous violence, which is not really there, and the image of the issues that I found are these failures of the regulatory state are not, on the, are not yeah. enough on the front pages. Okay, yeah. You had a question. Yeah. Um, it seemed in the book that about 50% of the stories were relating to European immigrants and 50% to non-European immigrants. Um, relating it back to Brexit, a lot of the uh, verbiage around leaving the EU was about regaining control and it seems that the UK government could potentially have controlled 50% of the non-European migration, even if there was free movement within the EU. Did that, did that element of having been able to exercise more control over immigration, but not having chosen, not having chosen to done, do so, enter into any of the Brexit debate or the UK political debate, or was that absent? So I. I, I, one of the things I really noticed was that the UK badly managed its immigrant labour market. Right? No minimum wage enforcement, consequently a lot of friction with trade, tradesmen in those trades, a lot of overcrowding, a lot of, you know, in a lot of workplace injuries. And one place where we can really see that is homelessness in London. So the so majority of people, uh, the last time I checked the statistics was last year, so I apologize that they're out of date, were of the homeless in the streets of London are A8 immigrants, as they're called, accession eight immigrants. So the question is like, why? What's happening here? And when I reported it and I dug into it, you started to see migrants arriving, low information migrants arrive, don't know the regulatory setup they have to, to get in, don't know that they need to get insurance, that they need to get this, they need to get an address, then they, get, they can get their national security card, and then they can start earning. They need to quickly get work. They get it in this bandit labor market, have an accident. Two weeks later, you're on the street. And there's a lot of that that I noticed. And I think that the UK government could definitely have better managed yeah. the dynamics of the labour market. And I think that if it had done that, we, that would have been enough to, to change the impressions. Would it be enough to sway the vote? I think maybe. You, know, you can see that there are other countries in Europe which took a very different approach. Like, you know, Sweden or Sweden's had very high rates of immigration, but it's got a very, very tight control. It's got a stronger regulatory state at the sharp end of the of the labour market. In terms of like, could the UK have better managed the? Could the UK have better managed migration in a more general sense? As I said earlier, like the UK could have put controls in like. France or Germany uh, did. In fact, only the UK and Ireland didn't. 
and they just simply made this mistake in thinking that there would be less migration that's coming from, the, the less migration will come from Eastern Europe. In that way, I think that the Brexit narrative, I don't really want to call it that, there is a little bit of truth there, which is that they simply did not anticipate the scale of the immigration. And that was when the history of the European Union is written again, as always it's been written several times, they will, like a lot of attention will be paid to why did people not anticipate the scale of this immigration within the EU? And that, I think we've talked, we could go on, they do another event even about <laughs> uh, what are the effect, what effects is that happening on Poland and Romania? Like if you look at Poland and Romania, you've got by some estimates up to 20% of the population of Romania that has migrated. What's that doing to these yeah. societies? How are they? What? Well, how's that shaping their develop? How's that shaping their development? And you have even larger numbers of Romanians present in Spain or in Italy. So I think that that's. That's something that that's, there's a, you know, that, that, that's something which I think is, that is very interesting and you can't really ignore. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can also talk at the bar a bit more maybe oh, sure, instead yeah. of the other event. Um, last question for you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would have liked to ask about the analogies of your book with uh, George Orwell's oh, Down Out in London, Paris, of oh. course. But um, to keep it uh, on another team, uh, we've been talking now about the debt spiral, of, for example, I guess Romania, Bulgaria. Demographically, um, these are very poignant themes. But on the personal level of your journalism, I'm really wondering uh, to what extent do you feel isolated as a journalist with uh, your dialectics? Um, I mean, I appreciate a few journalists in Europe. I am very fond of your journalism. Oh, I must you. really say that. Uh, Bruno Machas, who is a, a more think fan man, is a very wise thinker. Oh, but yes, like these kind of discourses seem to be very isolated in Europe. And I would really like to get your viewpoint on how you suppose such dialectics could be organized on a broader scale. I don't know, well, you'd have to just... <laughs> like, uh, well, thank you very much for your such a, being so kind. Um, uh, I, you know, I just, but I've been very, I've, been, I've had, I've, I've had quite an eccentric career, and I've been very lucky, and I think that that's shaped the the work that the, the that I that I do. I, I um, you know, I've had the I've had the chance as well to bounce in and out of think tanks, and I think that's been, I think that's been very, I think that's been, uh, I think that's been very enriching, and. I had the chance to be bilingual in English and French, and that's, you know, I think shaped how I approach these, uh, approach these issues. I, I think the, I think the, you know, how could you make journalism better? I think it's the, it, it's almost been said, you can't say it enough, you know, and they say that you, they only start to listen to you once you've said it, once you're so bored of saying it, but you just need to regulate the social media giants as publishers and you need to tax them, and you need to, you know, you need to to return media outlets uh, access to the remuneration that they're they're generating from it. Yeah, yeah. And maybe to end on a personal note, then we also need more journalism. You're working on a new book. Is there anything you can say about that? So the, 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 well, I guess the personal note that I want to the personal note I want to want to end on is that. You know, I really believe in all these different techniques of journalism. I really think that you can do, you know, you can do great things as a thoughtful columnist, like you mentioned, Bruno Machais, you know. You can really, and it's really important, and it's really, you can re I really believe in what you can do in that format. And you can do really cool things with reportage and with analysis and by data analysis. And, you know, I think these are, you know, I think it's, you know, journalism has gone through a difficult mm -hmm. transition through, in the you know as we enter deeper into surveillance capitalism, but I, you know I do I, I still I, you know I really believe that you can do, you can you can change a debate and you can really you can really do great things uh, yeah. through through writing and that the key to all of them in doing them well I think 
is going beyond the screen and like spending time traveling in Central Asia or you know trying to be as immersed as possible in in London or like traveling to as many European countries as you you can and not falling for what I mentioned earlier which is this this sort of megalomaniac illusion that all information is on yeah. Wikipedia and I think where we go wrong and I do it I do it all the, every day you know on Twitter every day is thinking oh great I found all these statistics on Wikipedia that's me done I'm on top of that debate and I think that's the what yeah. you need to avoid you didn't mention a new book, but I'm gonna let you oh, off the hook yeah, with that. Yeah, let me off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, um, I'd, it's I'd about like, my it's about migration again. I, <laughs> I'd like to say that um, that last comment of you was, uh, I think, really powerful. Also, in what we can do with journalism, it struck me that during dinner we had beforehand, the moment someone started talking, you started scribbling on your notebook. So start scribbling more is also a lesson, maybe. Yeah, but I never read. I never read it afterwards. So I scribble. Oh, you never read it after. <laughs> Maybe that's because just, of the dinner party. I, reco I, I record. Yeah. I record people. Any of it, I, I, will, I pay to get transcriptions made. Which is a real time saver. Yeah. Well, it's very expensive, but yeah. like I yeah. use. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I pay to get. Yeah, and I do transcriptions, and I've, I've noticed that like younger journalists tend to use transcriptions and recording. I take notes, but I think that's more of a kind of yeah. helping me concentrate. You yeah. know, than, than anything else because I never read them they all they all sit there like some archive yeah. well let's get a drink I would say oh, thank you. I, I would like to thank Cody so much for joining in and telling us a bit more about the other cities in Europe I would like to thank it was a pleasure talking to you and I wish you uh, well great fun also traveling the Netherlands talking oh, you. about no, no, your no, no, book I'm, and your work I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here yeah yeah so give me a warm welcome thank you so much for coming Ben Judah Cody Hoxema I just like to say there's someone walking with some um, magazines, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, if Thank you want you know. to read a little bit more about Europe and how we can maybe, well, read some quality journalism, you can buy Ben Judah's book, of course, but you can also, there yes. there's a group of young journalists making an amazing magazine. It's called Are We Europe? And uh, well, you, you see her standing there. Uh, take a look through it because I think it's important also. Uh, I hope to see you at the bar and uh, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.